The Kirtland's warbler, the rarest migratory songbird in North America. As recently as the mid-1980s, the Kirtland's warbler teetered on the brink of extinction. But today, their population is stable and secure, thanks to the wise stewardship and forest management efforts of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, private working forest owners, and their conservation partners. In fact, the Kirtland's warbler has become an unparalleled conservation success story. Because of this success, Kirtland's warbler management has shifted from preventing extinction to sustaining a healthy population. Conservation agencies and their partners have built a model that not only protects the Kirtland's warbler into the future, but also provides benefits for other plants and animals in the ecosystem, and ultimately for people too. Even though the Kirtland's warbler is no longer considered endangered, it will always be rare. Unlike other bird species that live and breed in multiple habitats and climates, the Kirtland's warbler is picky about where it nests. Kirtland's warbler are a habitat specialist, meaning they require a very narrow range of conditions. And in Michigan, that's, that's young jack pine forest that's generally five to 15 years old and will also be about five to 15 feet in height. If it's too young, they, they won't use it. And once it gets past 15 years old or so, they'll move on to some other place that has young forest five to 15 years. The Kirtland's warbler needs this combination of young jack pine trees and sandy soil because it builds its nest on the ground under the overlapping branches of young trees. During heavy rains, the sandy, quick draining soil prevents water from pooling on the surface and drowning the eggs or nestlings and the overlapping tree branches provide cover and protection from predators. These specific conditions exist only in a few places in Michigan, Wisconsin, and eastern Ontario. The cycle starts in early May. Every year, the first male Kirtland's warblers arrive on their nesting grounds after migrating from their wintering grounds in the Bahamas. Even though it's spring, the climate in this region is harsh, and the birds sometimes return to sub-freezing temperatures and snow. When a male finds a suitable territory, he'll fly to the top of a tree, throw back his head, and sing. A few days later, the females begin to arrive, pair up with a male and mate. The female builds the nest and typically lays four or five eggs. Only the female incubates the eggs, but the male brings her food while she's on the nest, and both are involved in bringing food to the young. For the rest of the summer, the birds will molt into their winter plumage, then put on as much fat as they can in preparation for the long trip back to the Bahamas. In September, the warblers leave their breeding grounds and fly south, over a thousand miles to the Bahamas, and a few other small islands in the Caribbean, where the habitat looks nothing like the pines of the North Woods. The habitat in the Bahamas is very different from habitat in Michigan, primarily in that the shrub layer is much, much more dense, and we do not find them in pines, which at one time it was thought the Kirtland warblers overwintered in pines in the northern Bahamas. So instead, it's just this dense shrub layer with occasional tall trees coming up through the shrub layer and looks nothing like the habitat here on the breeding grounds. The protection and creation of habitat on the Kirtland's warbler's wintering grounds is just as important as the northern breeding grounds. The Kirtland's warblers winter mostly in the central Bahamas in very short, dense coppice, which is hardwood shrubs. And they forage in those shrubs, but we find a lot of them, particularly on goat farms. And apparently what the goats do is that they keep the shrubs short and they promote, apparently in some fashion, the growth of wild sage and black torch, which produces fruit that the birds like. And then there are a lot of insects as well on those shrubs that the Kirtland's warblers feed on, as well as ants on the ground. If the warblers are unable to find enough food on their wintering grounds, it can reduce the number of young they can raise the following spring. 
Well, the good thing is, is that the Bahamas does not have as huge a population as other West Indian places. We have a population of about 400,000 people. And the good thing is, is that the majority of those people, about 70% of them, are situated on one small island, Nassau, New Providence. And the rest of the islands have smaller populations. And because of that, you have a lot more habitat that the birds can use that have not been really disturbed that can be detrimental to the species. So I guess just by a small population, alone and the fact that it's concentrated on just a few major islands that has helped the bird out a lot. Like the shrub habitat on the wintering grounds in the Bahamas, the jack pine ecosystem here on the breeding grounds is formed by a unique group of plants and animals that live and function as a unit. But the jack pine ecosystem is different because everything that lives here depends on fire. Historically, large fires ignited by lightning or set by Native Americans to enhance hunting and foraging frequently swept across this region in the spring and autumn. When fire burns through the crowns of mature trees, it strips the trees of their branches and needles. Sunlight penetrates to the ground and plants that have been dormant underground begin to grow again. This ground cover, made up of blueberry, bearberry, sweet fern, grasses, and shrubs, provides ample food as well as cover for the warbler's nests. As the jack pines grow and mature, the ground plants become shaded out and go back into a dormant state, waiting for the next fire or other disturbance to give them their next season in the sun. Fire also plays a critical role in jack pine reproduction. Unlike most other pine trees, jack pine cones are sealed with a wax-like substance and pop open under the intense heat of fire. After the fire passes, seeds fall to the ash-enriched soil, germinate, and new trees begin to grow. After about five years, the trees become attractive to the breeding warblers. Because of its association with these young stands of jack pines, the Kirtland's warbler is sometimes referred to as the bird of fire. But as the human population grew in the region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, fire was no longer viewed as a natural feature of the ecosystem, but as a hazard to humans and their property. So in the early 20th century, fires were suppressed before they could spread across the landscape, putting the Kirtland's warbler population into a slow, steady decline. The natural processes such as wildfire that, that occurred pre-settlement just don't happen anymore. So now it's up to us to provide those, those young, expansive areas of jack pine in that five to seven year old age class to actually keep this species going. It's what's called a conservation reliant species. Without our helping hand from these agencies, the species would slowly vanish. When the DNR originally established management areas for Kirtland's Warbler in 1958, a couple of these areas were um, burnt over uh, wildfire areas that, that had habitat, Kirtland's Warbler habitat that was created by wildfire. We can't allow wildfire to burn across the landscape anymore for personal protection, property protection reasons, health and safety. We have an extensive fire protection program in the DNR to protect against wildfire for lots of good reasons. So we simulate that wildfire created condition through harvest and replanting of young jack pine. We now understand that we have an obligation to the Kirtland's warbler and other species in this ecosystem. But rather than allowing wildfires to burn as they once did, land managers now simulate wildfire by cutting large plots of mature trees and replanting them with young trees. A few large trees are left behind to provide structure and habitat for other animal species, as well as singing perches for Kirtland's warblers. Because cutting doesn't produce the heat needed to open jack pine cones, managers plant jack pine seedlings in the cut areas. Other species such as pin oak and black cherry naturally sprout and provide diversity. Since early 1970s, we've used this planting pattern that we call opposing wave, and it's a, it's a really elegant solution to try to get a complex of thickets and openings. All of the young jack pine seedlings are planted in, in trenches to reduce competition and give them a little one or two year head start. And so these tractors have to go through and create trenches. You think about operationally how you would drag a tractor through a cutover stand and leave open areas, what the opposing wave pattern does is there will be, if you think about like a sine wave, if you remember from math class, um, the, the wave will go uh, 10 rows in this direction, and then below that, the wave will go opposite 10 rows in this direction. And what you end up with are 10 rows one way, 10 rows the other, and where those waves go apart, 
you end up with openings. And then where they come together, you end up with thickets. And so that results in the 75%, 25% thickets to openings pattern that we're trying to attain. There are still a few carefully selected areas where managers conduct prescribed burns to more naturally regenerate young jack pine forests for Kirtland's warblers and other species. A few other areas of the jack pine ecosystem are simply cut and burned periodically to provide habitat for plants and animals that prefer open lands. We're trying to match all the other services that fire provided the natural range of variation of tree heights and species diversity. That's what we're trying to do. We've seen that if you build it, they will come. Through a combination of sound science and trial and error, conservation agencies eventually hit upon the right formula to successfully support the Kirtland's warbler population recovery. Now that the Kirtland's warbler population is considered stable, those same conservation agencies and their partners are starting to experiment again, searching for ways to maintain the warbler's population, but do it in ways that are less expensive and more efficient. Over time, Managers have also learned that other species benefit from active jack pine management. Brewer's blackbird, upland sandpiper, common nighthawk, spruce grouse, mice, voles, and coyotes all prefer the youngest jack pine stands. Hermit thrush, vesper sparrow, eastern towhee, and eastern bluebird also prefer stands with trees less than 15 feet tall. Jack pine management also benefits humans. People of all ages and backgrounds use young jack pine habitat to hunt snowshoe hare, wild turkey, and white-tailed deer, and to pick blueberries. Older jack pine forests provide trails for hiking, horseback riding, and snowmobile and ATV riding. And in a unique partnership, the timber industry plays a critical role in helping to conserve the Kirtland's warbler. Cutting down several hundred acres of forest at a time may appear destructive, and many people have been trained by popular culture to think that cutting trees is bad for conservation. But nothing could be further from the truth for species that depend on fire to renew their habitats. Cutting down forests helps to replicate the natural fires that occurred on these lands throughout history, fires that were vital to the Kirtland's warbler's very existence. Mimicking those fires with clear cutting is now necessary for the survival of the Kirtland's warbler. The warbler could not survive without this continued human intervention. Harvested trees are processed into pulp for paper, pellets for wood stoves, mulch for gardens and other wood products, and provide jobs for local workers and support rural economies. Another huge benefit to local economies comes from the dollars generated by birders who flock to northern Michigan to see the Kirtland's warbler. Every year, thousands of people come from all over the world to communities in the habitat area, hoping to catch a glimpse of a handsome bird that battled extinction and won. They stay in local motels, eat at local restaurants, buy souvenirs, and inject money into towns that wouldn't otherwise see much early spring tourism. They come because for many people, the Kirtland's warbler has become more than just another bird. And I think what's special about the Kirtland's warbler is the connection that it has to the landscape. It's tied to it. And I don't know, I think there's something really beautiful in that specialization. I think it's amazing the way that it evolved with the entire ecosystem. I think that's really amazing that it's evolved to this point to, to come only here in all the places in the world. It comes only here where things were just right. It's a species that's uniquely Michigan. My home, 99% of the population breeds here in northern Michigan, where I reside. But more than that, I think um, there's this tremendous conservation legacy here. Individuals that have worked on this species since the 1950s and longer, all the way back to the 1920s. And in a small way, I've been able to contribute to that conservation. Everybody involved with Kirtland's Warbler Conservation is so dedicated and passionate. It's infectious to be around those people. And so it's an endless well that keeps replenishing me. Conservation is not always happy work. And this is always happy work. That's why the Kirtland's Warbler is important to me.
That feeling of pride is universally shared by the members of the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team, a diverse group of wildlife conservation agencies, non-governmental organizations, and private citizens from the United States, Canada, and the Bahamas. The group meets twice a year to discuss concerns, assess their management efforts, and plan for future research to answer questions about all aspects of the species' life cycle, breeding, wintering, and migration. I think what we found that's really unique about working with Kurtluth warblers, one, of course, it's one of the rarest songbirds in North America, and then being, being able to work together to piece a puzzle together and how you can protect a bird throughout its whole life cycle, the whole life cycle being the breeding range, wintering range, and the migration route. And trying to get the research in place and get the questions answered relative to conservation issues and then beginning to apply that has been very integrative and therefore very satisfying. It's taught me lessons about how to be uh, the conservation biologist that I want to be. It made me find the questions that inspired me. And also it brought me to a group of people that I think are probably the most amazing group of partners that I've ever encountered. This group just finds a way to get done what needs to be done out here. And so the bird inspires me with its story and the people that work on it inspire me with the way they come together and become part of that story. People tend to think about places like these jack pine woods through a human perspective. Too often they ask, how can the woods serve our needs, instead of how we can serve the needs of these woods? One way we can better serve these woods is to change the way we think about them, because the value of the jack pine ecosystem extends well beyond measurables like dollars and cents. So timber sales are only part of the picture. The other part of the picture are the ecological services. And what I mean by ecological services is all of the values that this landscape provides. For humans, we get water value, clean air from the plants. All of the ecological connections with the organisms in this landscape are all performing ecological services that we benefit from. And then in addition to that, there's recreational values, there's aesthetic values. Some people don't think this is a beautiful landscape, but some people do. So you combine all of that and there's value in that. It's not as easily measured as a timber sale, but it has value and it should be included. The Kirtland's Wobbler is a good example. It's a great success story. It's great to see that the bird went from under 200 pairs to over 1,700 pairs. And so that is very, very special to see that the species has rebounded over the past 20, 30, 40 years. The Kirtland's Warbler is an incredible conservation success story. A few short decades ago, this tiny bird was perched literally at the brink of extinction. With careful planning and hard work, and probably a little luck along the way, people took on and defeated the many challenges the bird faces. Against all odds, this bird of fire has become the first conservation-reliant species to be removed from the federal endangered species list. I think it's very important to look at the Kirtland's warbler as a model for endangered species recovery. So many other endangered species out there have very strong ties to ongoing conservation. They're conservation reliant. New partnerships need to be made and developed like the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team, like the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, to work with all of our agencies and all of our other existing partners to see how we can manage a bird into the future or how we can manage a species into the future that always needs some level of management get it to the point where that species status is secure, where we're not at risk of extinction, and be able to put more efforts and more time into some of those other species that are at the brink of extinction again. The story of the Kirtland's warbler is not over, and active forest management will be required to keep the population healthy. But with continued support from conservation agencies and organizations, and people like you, this colorful traveler will maintain its place in the jack pine ecosystem for many generations to come. <laughs>